Hmm, what's in the box? Could it be part of the big announcement? Good afternoon, everybody. How's today been? Good? Excellent. I absolutely just love the energy in the room. It's been terrific. Thank you for being such an incredible audience instead of attendees. I first met Dan Schulman six years ago. It was shortly after Walmart announced that American Express would begin offering a prepaid card called Bluebird at the retailer stores. When the news broke, I remember thinking that I would never in a million years have imagined those two brands, Walmart and American Express, to show up in the same headline together. And I knew that I had to meet the people behind the deal. So I managed to get a meeting with Dan at American Express in their headquarters in Lower Manhattan. And I'm all dressed up, and I'm ushered into Dan's office overlooking the Statue of Liberty. And there he is in a blue v-neck sweater, jeans, and cowboy boots. We sit down, and we start talking about prepaid cards and the people who use them and the power of mobile technology to democratize access to financial services. But the thing I remember most from that conversation was how Dan explained the Bluebird deal and his role at Amex. He said, I'm here to transform an exclusive brand into an inclusive brand. That one statement explained everything. It explained Bluebird, it explained the cowboy boots, and as I would come to understand over time, it would really come to explain the man himself. Because Dan is not only one of the most genuine leaders I know, he is also one of the most inclusive. He sees everything that the world has to offer, and he sees it as his mission to make sure that everyone can partake. Having found a kindred spirit, I knew I wanted to spend more time with this guy. I also knew that Dan could be the perfect poster child for CFSI's work. I mean, after all, here was a corporate CEO who had a shared vision around inclusion and was building businesses and a brand that would make that vision a reality. Now, Dan didn't just talk the talk. From Bluebird, Amex went on to build Serve, a mobile prepaid account offered beyond the Walmart stores. And Dan then sponsored the creation of a documentary film about the challenges faced by those living at the margins of the financial system. It was called Spent, Looking for Change. If you haven't seen it yet, you can watch it on YouTube. I would really highly encourage it. And it premiered right here in LA, actually, the last time we were all here for a merge. Shortly after, though, it was announced that Dan had been tapped as president of PayPal, soon to be CEO once it split off from eBay. For me, this was the moment of truth. Did Dan really care about all that inclusion stuff, or was that just his job at Amex? And if, it, if there was ever any doubt, it quickly became evident that Dan's passion was real and that the PayPal role was going to give him an even bigger global platform for making good on his vision. Once his feet hit the ground in Silicon Valley, he immediately began the work of transforming the culture of PayPal from that of a technology company to that of a consumer company. PayPal was the first major corporation to adopt financial health as part of its overall mission and vision. Under Dan's leadership, the company has invested heavily in research of all kinds to get to know their customers, to understand their lives, their needs, and to build products and experiences that go beyond simply moving money to help people improve their financial health. Two months ago, the company unveiled version 1.0 of these efforts, a suite of basic banking services in the form of a prepaid card, direct deposit, and money transfer. These efforts aren't a sideshow like they are at some companies. They are at the core of the business. At a time when Wall Street can punish CEOs who speak their mind and take stands on the issues of the day, Dan has doubled down. He canceled PayPal plans to open a new global operations center in Charlotte a couple of years ago, following passage 
of a North Carolina law that prevented cities from creating non-discrimination policies based on gender identity, otherwise known as the bathroom bill. He said at the time, becoming an employer in North Carolina where members of our teams will not have equal rights under the law is simply untenable. The new law perpetuates discrimination and it violates the values and principles that are at the core of PayPal's mission and culture. Dan has taken his message of inclusion around the world. He's the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Promoting Global Financial Health Inclusion Project. And earlier this year, Dan was instrumental in the creation of a new body, the CEO Partnership for Financial Inclusion, a group of senior leaders from a diverse set of leading multinational companies who are committed to accelerating financial inclusion around the world. Convened by the UN's Special Advocate on Inclusive Finance, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, this is the first group tackling financial inclusion that I know of that includes companies beyond the financial services sector, including ones such as Pepsi and Unilever. Right around the time of this year's World Economic Forum, it, I was sitting in my living room in Chicago reading the newspaper when I saw another headline that blew my mind. It said, Dan Shulman on shifting from financial inclusion to financial health. Dan had penned an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on the eve of Davos. In it, he wrote, as we head into 2018, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to expand our focus from traditional notions of financial inclusion to the broader goal of universal financial health. This means instead of just measuring how many people have a payment account, we must consider all of the financial services that people need to take control over their financial lives. Everything from financial planning tools for managing budgets and expenses to access to affordable credit to start businesses and invest in college, insurance to help deal with unexpected expenses, retirement accounts for long-term savings, and more. It was after reading that op-ed that I slacked Laura Barger and I said, we need to give this man an award. And so tonight we are. Dan inspired us to create a Financial Health Visionary Award to recognize individuals who have shown unparalleled leadership toward building a more accessible and inclusive financial system, and who seek to continue to inspire and encourage other leaders to make financial health a priority. The award, the award aligns with CFSI's support for leaders who have embraced financial inclusion as a key business strategy that can drive bottom line business benefit hand in hand with social impact for individuals and small businesses around the world. And so today, I am absolutely thrilled to be able to present Dan Schulman with the inaugural CFSI Financial Health Visionary Award. Please join me in congratulating Dan as I welcome him to the stage. Thank you. I'm going to take that from you, yeah. please. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Jennifer. So, I'm a firm believer, Dan, that people are really shaped by where they've come from, and that while there are many things about leadership that, one can, that, that can be learned, sort of the passion and mission that you bring is something that you, uh, that you come by based on where you come from, how you're raised, what are your influences. Tell us a little bit about what influences you. Who has made you this person? I think all of us are made by I mean, literally, and then figuratively, <laughs> made by our parents. Um, and uh, so um, 
I mean, the, the people who influenced me most clearly uh, were my mom and my dad. Um, and um, we really had nothing um, growing up. Uh, I was born in Newark, um, moved to a, an apartment in New Brunswick, uh, the great state of New Jersey. My mom took me to civil rights marches when I was a kid in my stroller. Uh, this was a time where really civil rights marches were not something that you took lightly. There was always the uh, specter of potential violence in them. Um, my mom would march down in the south, and I remember being with my dad very early age. There are no cell phones or anything, just he was pacing that house back and forth, worried about you know, whether she'd come back and in what shape she would come back. So my grandfather was a union organizer. I mean, there was a lot of very kind of left, uh, left uh, um, values that were put into me. And then, um, you know, I grew up and, you know, I wasn't exactly sure where I wanted uh, to go. Certainly it wasn't Wall Street. I mean, you know. Everybody says that I'm like, occupy Wall Street, not Wall Street. Um, <laughs> or I dress like it for sure. Um, but, um, but I really um, learned at an early age that uh, uh, there are a lot of people uh, in this world who don't have a voice, who are underserved, uh, who struggle. That was me um, growing up. That was my parents growing up. It's definitely my grandparents. I still have family members who struggle. So it comes very naturally, and it comes uh, with a kind of an authenticity through and through. Um, so uh, I think this is our greatest responsibility and, uh, and challenge uh, as an industry. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, as long as I'm around and can do something about it, I feel I've got a obligation and really almost a moral obligation to do so. Yeah. So when you don't come by it as honestly as you do, how do you, how do you get yourself there, you know, for other leaders? Well, I think there are two things that um, probably most of us respond to. There's things we feel with our heart, and there are things we intellectually understand. Um, and I think you can argue the facts of the matter that we're in the middle of a, of a crisis. It's playing out in ways that um, are not just the individual anymore. It's really society. It's our, our political systems are under tremendous stress. There is a huge amount of populism. Um, and you have to basically say there's populism for a reason. It's because people are worried about their future. They feel the system is letting them down. And they are voting not for somebody, but against what, what is. And um, many people have heard me say this, but um, you know, my favorite quote on democracy is democracy needs to be more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. Um, so think about that. Um, <laughs> but it, what it basically means is for a democracy to flourish, you have to rise above your own self-interest. Um, but how do you rise above your own self-interest? If you're on the very bottom of Maslow's need hierarchy and you're worried about making ends meet at the end of the month, you're worried whether your kids will have a better future or not. And so I think intellectually, these things are becoming like right uh, right in our face right now, and maybe it was somebody over there, but now I, this isn't fringes of our population. This is mainstream. This is the new middle class. Mm -hmm. These are uh, people we all know, and it's not, it's a segment of the market. It's probably the biggest segment of the market. So I think, one, we can all intellectually get it, but I think the time that it really hit me um, is when you actually go out and experience it. So when I was at Virgin Mobile, we supported homeless youth. 
And I was hoping you were going to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, and the thing that really got me to understand homelessness was sleeping out in the streets of New York as a homeless person. Um, you know, I probably already looked that way, but, um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so it wasn't hard to fake it. But having no money, begging for money, uh, it's pretty humiliating, pretty difficult to go do. You, your, your safety's at at hand all the time. You're trying to figure out where to sleep. Police are moving you along. And I, I really felt it viscerally in my heart. Um, and it's changed the way I look at homelessness ever since. So when I got to American Express, before I really started um, talking about the underserved, um, or unbanked as I called it at the time, until you taught me to call it <laughs> underserved, um, you know, we did an exercise where we went out and we tried to cash a check, and we tried to send a bill, um, and we tried to send money uh, to somebody. And everybody should do it. I'm sure most of you already have done it. But if we you, did this with you. It was yeah. our FinX. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do it, you realize when you're standing in line at a check cashing mm -hmm. location, and the people behind you, and you're standing on there maybe like for 45 minutes, the people behind you are going, ah, you know. Sam got held up by, you know, a robbery right outside here. You know, there's more incidents of violent crime mm -hmm. around these things. I get up to the check cashier location. I've been waiting for 45 minutes. People, it's like during flu season, people are like <laughs> coughing all over me. And, um, and I come up with my check, and my check says Dan Shulman, and my driver's license says Daniel Shulman, and they wouldn't cash the check. But they said I could go up to an apartment down the street where they would cash checks like that for like 10 or 15%. And I was like, OK, I've done the, <laughs> enough of this to begin to understand what the real issues are. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to be able to talk about it much more passionately and as a firsthand participant. And I, so I think for leaders and yeah. for others, so it's sort of now a requirement in PayPal, you have to understand the issue, and then you need to experience it to really feel it viscerally yeah it's really um about building empathy yeah 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 so you you set a really uh nice stage for the moment we're living in the precariousness the challenge and i don't just mean for those of us who are financially struggling i mean we are living in a time of tremendous uncertainty and upheaval economically politically socially um what is it like to be a leader on the world stage at this moment how do you do that yeah, well, I think it's more difficult than ever before because I think much more is expected um, of leaders now. I think much more is demanded of leaders. I think much more is necessary from leaders. But employees um, expect that leaders will act on the values of the company, uh, not just have those values hanging on a wall. Um, and I think sometimes those values come under attack. Um, and as I said, after Charlottesville, not Charlotte, but after Charlottesville, where you know, we um, try not to allow PayPal to be used to be funded for uh, people who advocate for any kind of hate or mm -hmm. uh, violence. But hate's a very difficult thing to define. Where does free speech end and where does hatred begin? And we take that very seriously. My view is always like Nazis are like, I don't know who's going to debate that, but like we're not allowing that on PayPal. KKK, other things, we're not just not allowing that. People can debate whether that's free speech or not, but not for, not for me. Um, but there are other ones that are more difficult. And what I said to our... Uh, my staff and every, uh, a lot of other people is there's no way to avoid the cultural wars if you're a big consumer uh, uh, company. You have to make stands. But those stands need to be values-based stands, not political decisions. Mm -hmm. Like, I never thought that HB2, North Carolina, was a red issue or a blue issue. I know a lot of people did associate it that way. I thought it was a red, white, and blue issue. I thought it was an American issue. I thought it was against the values of our country. You know, we're a country of immigrants. Um, you know, I quoted Emma Lazarus at uh, our all-employee meeting mm -hmm. um, at, when talking about this. 
Because, you know, and after immigration bill came out, we had eight people affected by that at PayPal, eight. And somebody, and I was like on CNN saying that I thought it was unconstitutional. And um, one of our employees said like, why are you out there making such a big deal about this when there are only eight people inside, you know, we have 20,000 people inside PayPal. And I said, well, I think you might feel different if you were one of the eight people. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think it's a slippery slope. I really think it's a slippery slope. If you start allowing discrimination here, um, then who knows where it may wind up. And I think that um, businesses now need to be a force um, for good in the, in the market. I, I think we just actually need to stand up. We cannot allow uh, certain ills and certain injustices and certain assaults on civil rights to happen um, and not be part of the solution. Like, I, I don't really believe that you know, we are solely about for profit. I believe we have a bigger responsibility as corporations, and we need to address that. And we, need, and we have so much power to go and do that. I mean, it's really an unfair sort of thing. We can attract incredible talent. We have great resources to apply to this. I think our whole mission and vision is against democratizing financial services. It's 20,000 people with a lot of uh, gusto and passion around it, focused on one thing. We should be able to make a difference uh, in the world. Now, we can't do it alone. We need to partner with regulators. We need to partner with governments. Mm -hmm. We need to partner across the industry. And it's one of the, I heard it at a panel right before mm -hmm. this, and I agreed. Um, with the person who said this is that we need to figure out how we come together as an industry and take the best assets that we have, the best assets that maybe a traditional financial institution has, bring them together and put out value propositions into the market tailored to certain segments of the market that neither of us could do alone. And I feel like, um, and I said this at Money 2020, this is the moonshot idea of our industry. This is our time to go after this. Because think about what we can, like, you know how your kids always say, what do you do? Um, like, <laughs> yeah, have you got to an answer and you, for and, me? <laughs> and they, you know, and they know I work for PayPal, but, and actually they love Venmo, so I'm, I'm in good shape on that. But, um, <laughs> um, but, like, this is the thing that you want to say to your friends and your family that we made a difference in the world. And the thing that, um, gets to me about this crisis that we face is it's solvable. I really honestly believe it's solvable. Um, I wouldn't like throw myself into a, a problem that's not solvable, and there are a lot of them out there. And I'm not saying that any of us can solve it, but even like I always say inside the company, if we can solve it for one person, that's great. But if we can solve it for like 100 people, it's amazing, but we actually have the ability to maybe um, together, solve this for millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions. And imagine the energy that that could release into the world and, and the changes that that could make. And to me, um, it's exciting to think about it. Um, and the world's moving towards mobile, it's moving towards software, it's moving towards platforms. You know, you've got more power now in your palm of your hand than, you know, name the metaphor, the early moon lander is more power than a crazy supercomputer in 1990. You know, there's just, things are changing in the world and we have the ability to do things and imagine things that have never been done. And I think in financial services, that's especially true, that we need to imagine a future that may build on the shoulders of what we have, but it's different, fundamentally different. Not for everybody, because there are different segments of the market, but for the underserved market, we should be able to do things that make their lives much simpler and easier, um, much more secure, um, and we ought to be able to take some of that $170 billion that they spend um, and return that back to them 
so that they can save and be ready for emergencies and help their kids to go to college or to get an education. So we should be able to do that. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't, and we should not excuse ourselves if we don't. So I was going to ask you about the Larry Fink letter, but yeah. now I feel like I, I should ask you about the Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett op-ed. And frankly, <laughs> they're really a, both of, of a piece, which is the ills of short-term thinking and finding a way to uh, reorient from a sole singular focus on shareholders to something a little bit broader. Um, you're a publicly traded company, you're on the world stage, you obviously aren't scared to say what you think, but you do have a board and shareholders. How do you manage that? And what's your reaction to the kinds of stands that these folks are taking? Well, first of all, um, what's the best way of answering this question without... Uh, <laughs> without anything? the expletive? No, yeah. <laughs> no, here's the thing. There's not a dichotomy between uh, putting customers at the center of everything you do and being a great steward for shareholders. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think if you don't do that, you're never going to deliver what the potential of your company is. If you're not thinking about end-to-end -end solutions, mm -hmm. full end-to-end -end solutions to the pain points of the marketplace, and you're just putting out a product or you're doing something on a short-term basis, you're never going to build a great enduring company uh, over the medium term or the long term. And so to me, I don't think there's any uh, conflict between those two things. And, and you know, when we talk to uh, our shareholders, I'm very upfront with what our mission and vision is. We just had an investor meeting with a room even bigger than this because there are a lot of investors who are interested. And, um, and you know, I lay out exactly what the vision and mission is, I lay out kind of what we want to do from a platform perspective. They're very interested and think there's tremendous opportunity in PayPal and PayPal teaming with others and serving the underserved market because they know it's a huge marketplace out there. And if you can do it in the right way, it can be a very profitable marketplace um, as well. And, you know, this is not about, um, like a lot of people say to me, you seem to be an activist CEO. And I say, no, I'm just like trying to be a responsible leader of a, and a responsible citizen. Of a, of a company. I really don't feel like I want to be activists. I just feel like we have certain responsibilities. We actually have the opportunity to make a difference. And when you do that, you attract the best talent to your company by far and away. Like people, like one of the great surveys we just did at PayPal six, eight months ago is something like 96% of people at PayPal are proud to work there. Wow. That's like a huge thing. And why are they proud to work there? Because they know we're trying to make a difference. And they know we'll stand up for our values. They know we've got a very uh, inclusive and expansive mission, right? Democratizing financial services is making sure that, you know, managing and moving money is a right for all citizens, not just a privilege for the affluent. They want to make that happen. And they know since it's expansive and inclusive that we stand for diversity inside the company as well. Like my favorite quote about diversity is that diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. And we need to make that choice to be an inclusive society, an inclusive company. Why? Because we're a better company as a result of that. We're a stronger company as a result of it, and we will have better results. Uh, as a result of that as well. And so I feel like um, being that kind of company, being that kind of leader in a company like that is like every shareholder should go, yay, I love that. That's the right thing to do because they deliver uh, outsized returns as mm -hmm. a result of it. Mm -hmm. So I said earlier in my introduction that I have always seen you as a little bit of a poster child for our work, possibly selfishly, but it's true. Um, but as awesome as that is, we need more poster children. 
um, if we're going to actually move the needle. Yep. And you talked about that earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what are we going to do uh, to find more visionaries, more people we can give this award to in the future? Yeah. We're going to do like my parents did to me. They're going to shame you if you don't. Um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, I don't think it's going to be hard. Honestly, I don't think it's going to be hard. I also heard on the panel right before this, you know, I think the time has come right now. I think it was a lot harder quite some time ago. Um, but we've got 3.6 billion people in the world right now um, that are connected uh, to, the, to the internet. It's going to be half the world's population. You've got the vast majority of people who are going to have smartphones in their, in their hands. You can buy a smartphone in India now for $25. You've got governments that are really like, you know, the Modi administration in India, really thinking hard about mm -hmm. how do you, um, well, they, they think a lot about inclusion, but they're beginning to think about uh, health as well. Mm -hmm. But really, how do you create a whole software stack uh, to drive, um, uh, digital payments and uh, and take out middlemen and make sure there isn't leakage in the system. So I think we're at the right time and place right now, and we're fortunate about that. And we're also all really fortunate to work for companies that can make a difference. Like, no offense to whoever made this table. <laughs> like, I, I'm sure it's a great company, but like, and I'm sure they're very proud of how sturdy it is, but. <laughs> You know, I'm going to get in huge is trouble already. I hate somebody's going to say, don't say anything. But like, to me, that. this is, like, it's not going to make the difference in the world, but we can make a difference in the world based on what we do. Financial health, that foundation, to be sure that people feel comfortable and confident and can dream a little bit about what could be, um, is something we have the difference uh, or can make the difference about. And I think we're really fortunate about that. And, you know, as I go around the world, and I'm involved in a lot of forums now around the world, I'm involved with a ton of regulators around the world, we speak exactly this. Because every government, from the Chinese government to the Mexican government to the U.S. government, all want that their citizens have, are content, that their citizens can move ahead, that they're that they can create vibrant economies. And we should be able to help on that. And if they can't take that underserved market and bring them into that, there's unrest that can occur. Um, they can't maximize um, what they want to do as, a, as a governments. And so we're right in the middle of where we could be in our time. It's an exciting time, man. So, I mean, I'm sure there'll be somebody up here next year who will be uh, will be somebody that will inspire you and me and everybody else as well. Excellent. Well, there's yeah. a high bar to meet. Oh, so um, please join me in congratulating uh, Dan on his award. Thank you.